Good morning, everyone, and the warmest of welcomes to our online service this morning. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have the, the same experience as I have, but I frequently awaken in the morning with a song in my head, <laughs> usually a, a worship song, and frequently one from way back in my past that I've not heard or sung for many, many years. And it happened to me this morning, completely out of the blue, there's a fountain flowing filled with living water flowing from the Saviour's wounded side. There's an invitation to the heavy laden flowing from that river deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide. It's an old mission chorus that um, I think only the old, older ones among us will, uh, will recall. Certainly Donald will. Now, it started me thinking uh, about the... Uh, the scriptural, the biblical basis for these words, and I immediately thought about Psalm 46, uh, which I'm going to read to, to you in a minute or two, um, to call us to worship this morning. But it also occurred to me that we are Speyside Christian Fellowship, and we have on our doorstep a constant reminder uh, of the river whose streams Make glad the city of God, the people of God. Let me just read uh, the psalm to you just now. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done the desolations he has brought in the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time today to gather in your name, online, but still gathering in your name. And we thank you for these truths. We thank you that you're with us, that you are our fortress. We pray that you would brood over us this morning, even although we are not together um, physically. We pray that you would brood over us and draw us into your presence. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Let your living water flow over my soul. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control of every situation that has troubled my mind. All my cares and burdens unto you I roll.
so I won't be ashamed. The Lord loves the fire again. Don't let my love grow cold. I'm calling now. Light the fire again. Don't let my vision. Wondrous grace to me hath made known, nor by a worthy Christ in love redeemed me for His own. But I know how long I have believed, and am persuaded that He is able. To keep the which I committed unto him against that day. I know not how his saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within. I 
back. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it when there's restrictions and you're kind of feeling a little bit stuck. But the truth is, we're going somewhere. And we're going to read from Exodus chapter 15 this morning, really the first incident of the people of Israel after they've crossed the Red Sea and God has removed the Egyptians from pursuing them. So, reading from Exodus 15, verse 22 through to verse 27. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. You know, when they came out of Egypt, there was a great release as they, they left, not with nothing, they left with the riches of Egypt because all the Egyptians gave them all sorts of things. And they took all this stuff and off they went. And the first great obstacle they come to is the Red Sea. And God performs an incredible miracle there. And every time God does a work in your life, he's wanting to establish a truth into you of what more he can do. So if you've seen him part a sea that hundreds of thousands of folk can cross over, and then it comes together to wipe out the enemy that's pursuing you, that should build a real faith in you for God's amazing work and miraculous intervention in your life. But then you go into a wilderness, and you wander around, and you find there's no water. And in one way, that's a more serious problem, because without water, we're not going to live. And, of course, they, they respond not by looking back at the miracle and saying, well, let's see what God's going to do now. They think in the natural. They think in the way they used to think. Verse 23, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. And he said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians." 
for I, the Lord, am your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there besides the waters. I'm going to think about the sweetness of the Lord this morning and how he transforms those bitter waters into sweet and drinkable. But let's look a little bit about the Israelite story here. And this is what I feel the Lord would say to us as the church, to the body of Christ at this time. We're not going back, but we're going beyond. We're not going back to what we once knew. Not going back to think, oh, well, once restrictions are over, once, you know, vaccines are in place or whatever it takes, you know, many folk are longing for life to go back to some sort of normal. But for those of us who belong to the Lord, he's, he's saying, I don't want to take you back to what you knew as normal. I'm not taking you back to something. I'm taking you beyond where you've been. And this season now is an opportunity, an opportunity of preparation for something beyond where you've ever gone before. You see, you could sit around in this season and say, we're just waiting to get back. I don't need to learn anything else. I don't need to uh, grow in any particular ways. I just need to wait this out. I don't think that's the way to go. I think God's saying, there's something so beyond what you've yet seen, and I'm not showing you it yet. There's unfamiliar paths for you to walk on. I'm not giving you a blueprint. But you're going beyond where you've been. So get prepared to re-engage at a new level. Let this time be well used as a time of preparation, of deepening, of getting a hold of something more, of looking back at the, the partings of the Red Sea that came in your life and recognizing what's God going to do next. See, every problem we face in life, God has a solution. He is a solution for the heart of mankind, the heart of people in all its corruption. He is a, a, a solution for that. He is a solution for everything. The Israelites, they grumbled and looked back, and, and we'll see this pick up again very soon into chapter 16. They're grumbling again. They got the water, but they're wondering what are they going to eat? And they grumble again. And they grumble at Moses. And Moses says to them, listen, when you grumble at me, you're not actually grumbling at me, you're grumbling at the Lord. That's a wee bit serious. And there's a attitude and a response among the Israelites on this journey where they do quite a bit of grumbling. Grumbling and murmuring and complaining because their eyes were not on the God of solution. Their eyes were always in problems. And when we grumble and murmur, we get stuck there. We get stuck into something. The Israelites grumbled and looked back, but Moses called in the Lord and went beyond, did something he'd never done before. And so we come to these bitter waters. Bitter waters will leave a bitter taste. And some of you may have experienced in your life some bitter waters, some experiences, some difficulties, some tragedies, some breakable relationships, many different things that may be left a bitter taste in your mouth. And the good news is that God has a solution. God has something that he can transform the bitter waters into sweet. He transforms the bitter waters into sweet. And life can bring many things to us, disappointments, and how we respond to these things. When things don't go well when they don't go how we thought they might go. And deep inside us, there can be an anger, and if that anger doesn't get dealt with properly in a healthy way, that anger will often fester into a bitterness. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 4. And there's some warnings here from Paul. Ephesians 4.29. He says, let no unwholesome, and that word means rotten or corrupt. Let no word that's been corrupted, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. 
Now, Paul's talking to the, the new creation, because that's what he's been talking about in chapter 4. He's been talking about, you know, that we've put off the old self and we've been made new in Jesus. And he's saying, this is what it, this is what it now looks like. Don't live in the way you used to live. Don't do the things you remember doing that can so easily come back to you. Don't let unwholesome talk that's such an easy thing to do come out of your mouth. But let the, the new person that you are speak in a different way. That your words will give grace. Can you think of that? Your actual words can impart a grace into another person's life. What way do you want to speak? In a word that's unwholesome? That complains, that murmurs, that grumbles, that so easily pulls down? Or a word that actually adds something to the hearer? A word that brings grace into their life? Verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I think there's a number of ways we can grieve the Spirit, but if you look at the context of these verses, one of the greatest ways, one of the worst ways we grieve the Spirit is by unwholesome words. And so Paul says then in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Paul gives some warnings, but you know, he's already given the solution in his letter to the Ephesians. The solution comes right at the beginning. Verse 3 of chapter 1, what have we been given in Christ? We've been given every spiritual blessing. Isn't that wonderful? We've been given every spiritual blessing. You are now a new person who has been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And it's the realization of that, it's coming into agreement and alignment with that, that will enable us no longer to walk as we once walked, no longer to let all that stuff come out of our mouth, but only words that bring grace. That we can let go of the, the bitterness, the anger, and other things. And we sometimes need to be honest about these things, but we can let them go and come into alignment with what we have been given in Christ, who we are in Christ, and alignment with Christ. Where what we speak is kind and upbuilding, forgiving as he's forgiven us. But these Israelites back here, they didn't have the benefit of that grace. They didn't have that benefit of the revelation that Paul brings. They didn't have the benefit of the, the cross yet. And so they grumble and they complain. But Moses has a solution. Interesting that he uses a tree. And Christ would be crucified on the tree for us. And so we see the healing and the power that comes through God's sweetness. The healing that comes through God's sweetness. The waters are healed. In Ezekiel 47, as the river of God pours out, it goes into the other waters and it says when it enters the other waters, the waters there are made fresh. Or literally the Hebrew says the waters there are healed. There's a healing of the waters. There's an invitation, Isaiah 51, come to the waters. There's an invitation to come and drink, but we don't want to drink bitter waters. We want to drink the waters that the Lord provides, the sweet waters. Jesus says, the water that I give, the water that I give wells up unto eternal life. The water that Jesus gives. And if you've drunk some bitter waters in your life, let the Lord come and bring a transformation in that today. Let him turn those bitter waters into the sweet water. Let him bring the, the sweet water of Jesus and the words that he brings to you. I love this proverb, Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And who speaks more pleasant words, more fitting and right words than Jesus? Jesus who says to each of us, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Jesus who says, be freed from your affliction and infirmity. Jesus who says, be healed, be whole. Jesus who says, come follow me and I will give you life in all its fullness. From his mouth, we hear the best words we can ever hear. And those words, it says, they're sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And where some of the 
things of this life have in some way damaged, corrupted, and brought a bitterness into your soul, the Lord wants to bring a sweetness of his transforming grace into that place. And go right deep to the healing of the bones. It's interesting how much the scriptures speak about the bones. It's like the most internalized place within us. And you know, the, the, the things of life, the things that bring pain, wounding, corruption into our lives, if we don't deal with them, they go deep. And then they go very deep. And then they go right into the very bones. Now, I'm not saying it's the cause of everybody that's got bone problems, but one of the things that happens through life, through humanity, is that our, our bones begin to develop lots of problems. Many people have issues with the bones, the joints. And it's just an interesting thought that God wants to bring healing to the bones, but to do that, he maybe needs to bring that sweetness to the soul, first of all, to heal the soul's responses and then release that depth of healing in to the bones. And so the Lord comes to change the taste in your mouth. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He wants to change the taste in many people's mouths. I remember as a, a youngster, as maybe eight or nine, when I was first given a radish. Does anybody like radishes? I, 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 I hate the taste of radish. But the truth is, I've never eaten one since that day when I was about eight or nine years old. Because I remember eating the and the taste was so strong and to me so horrible. And I spent about two hours eating anything I could find that was sweet or anything different that would try and change the taste in my mouth. And I made a note to self, never eat a radish again. I've avoided them for the last 50 years. And continue, and will continue to do till the rest of my life, I imagine. <laughs> but it can be hard to change the taste in your mouth. Once you take something that's very strong and unpleasant, it, it can take a lot of doing to get that taste back out your mouth. But God has solution. This amazing solution to Moses in the desert place, take that tree and just cast it into the waters and they're transformed. God has something to put into us that will bring a transforming work of grace into the taste of our mouths. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We see in Scripture the sweetness of his mouth. Song of Solomon 5.16 His mouth is full of sweetness. His mouth is full of sweetness. You see, even when the Lord has to correct us and rebuke us, there's always a sweetness of grace within it. God didn't bring a law that made demands. He brought a law that showed us our need of grace. And then he brought the grace in Jesus. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth come in Christ Jesus. There's a sweetness of his word. Psalm 119 says, how sweet are your words to my taste. Letting his word into the deepest areas that have maybe been bitter in our soul through whatever has happened and allowing the sweetness of his words to transform. And the sweetness of his fruit, again in the Song of Solomon, his fruit was sweet to my taste. There's something really important about the mouth, isn't there? Something really important about the tongue, that little part of the body that can do so much good, but can do so much harm. So many people are spoken to out in our world in ways that are defeating and pulling down and even crushing. I was out for, for lunch with a friend on Friday. No radishes were on the menu. And the, the young lady who, who served us, it was, it was quite quiet and we just kind of engaged with her. And the talk, of course, is usually about masks and coronavirus and such things. And she made some comment, I can't remember what it was. And, and I said, no, we, we don't do any fear. We don't do fear. It says in Isaiah 8, don't fear what they fear. Because we're different. It doesn't mean we're stupid. and doesn't mean we're careless. But we don't give in to fear. It says we don't live by fear. And she began to engage with us in conversation. And, and we began to speak goodness into her life. We began to call things forth in her. My friend's a real prophet. And we began to call things forth in her life. 
And she was just resonating with this. She was, she was just loving it. Because somebody was speaking words to her that were actually giving grace into her soul. Now, if you're a waitress in a restaurant, you might get some good comments, but you might get some complaints as well. The fish was lousy. That wasn't hot enough. I don't like this seat. Whatever it might be. But here we were. We just spoke words of life to this young woman. And you know what she said to us? She says, I wish I could just sit down and have lunch with you two and listen to you all afternoon. You see, people in our world, they're not, they're, they, they hear enough harsh words. And they're not listening to the church. They haven't been for a long time. Let's get, let's be realistic about this. The vast majority of people in our land have not been listening to the church for a long time. But the unspoken message or the presumed message that they, so many have adopted is that the church is telling them, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, and thou shalt not do the next thing. And all they hear is the harshness of law. Now, those words are true. You know, the Ten Commandments are true and they're good and stealing and murder and adultery and things destroy life and they destroy society. But they don't contain the solution. And if we don't bring them to Jesus, if we don't bring them to the grace of God, people never get the solution. And the bitter waters maybe just get more bitter. And we've got to bring the solution of grace and truth that Jesus has for people. And our words are so important. That's why it's so important that we change the taste in our mouth, that you taste and see that the Lord is good, that something of that then begins to flow from our mouths and our lips. But as we drink of the sweetness of the waters of Jesus, the waters he gives, so our mouths become a source of, of sweetness. Again in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 11, the groom speaks to his bride as Jesus speaks to his church. And he says, your lips, my bride, drip honey. I love the poetic language of the Song of Solomon. Not everybody gets it, but there's some beauty in there. Your lips drip honey. Now, I hate radishes, but I love honey. (laughs) Your lips drip honey. And that is the overflow of a healed heart. A heart that is peace. A heart that maybe has known tragedy and known what could easily have caused bitterness. But has allowed Jesus to transform the waters. And has drunk in the sweetness of his water, his word, his fruit. And then out of our mouths, out of our hearts comes the overflow. And our words are sweet. And just a final bit. It's an interesting bit in verse 27 because they move on from this place where the bitter waters become sweet and they come to a place called Elam. And we've all the churches named after that today. But what do they find there? They find 12 springs of water and 70 date palms. I wonder if those numbers 12 and 70 remind you of anything. They remind me of two chapters in Luke. Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, where Jesus sends out his disciples. Not only the 12, but after that he sends out 70 others. And I think there's a big connection here. There's something about dealing with whatever is corrupting and making bitter our hearts, tasting the goodness of God, that our mouth no longer will speak unwholesome talk, but our mouth will speak that which will give grace to those who hear it, And then he says, now I can send you out to speak grace. Now I can send out my 12, but not just them. I can send out my 70. See, Jesus doesn't just mold a few and say, these are the ones. He's looking at the big group. He's looking at the 70 others. We don't know their names. We don't know who they are. We don't know what becomes of them. But Jesus trusts them enough that he says, I've put something of my grace, my sweetness in you. I've given you authority. Now go and tell people good news and heal the sick wherever you go. We're not going back. We're going beyond. We're not going back to what we once knew. We're not going back even to the the good things. You know, the older you get, the more you long for the good old days. 
I've reached an age now that I can sit and reminisce a little bit with some people. <laughs> and you think, oh, I'm getting old then, haven't I? But he doesn't want to take us back to the good old days, no matter how good they were, because God always has better days. I have a good friend whose catchphrase is simply this, the best is yet to come. And in Christ, it's true. It is true. And there's maybe some dips and some bends and some valleys and some mountains on that road, but we're going beyond. We're moving to something more. And let's let the Holy Spirit get gri- grip, take a grip of us and lead us beyond where we've ever been into the greater things that God has. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the one who's able to transform all things. And through the healing grace and power of Jesus, you transform even the bitter things in our life and can make them sweet. You give us water to drink that will change the taste of our mouths, that will refresh our soul and our spirit, that will so make us new that what would overflow from us will become sweet, grace-filled, life-giving, good news. And so work in us in these days that we would be ready to be sent out like the 12, the 70, and ready to go beyond where we've been before. We'd be looking forward into this new season where there will be a moving beyond into even greater things as we trust in you, Lord, to take us as you took Israel through that wilderness, but into the promised land. Take us into the fulfillment of promise for the glory of Jesus, that his name will be praised in this land more and more. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. In 1904, revival swept across Wales. God made himself known in a very special and personal way. After the revival, a Welshman ventured halfway across the world to India, and he trekked up the mountains towards a remote village in the east. He was told, go back. The tribe in that village are famously violent. But the Welshman ignored the warnings because even these savage headhunters should have the opportunity to hear about the mercy of God. One tribesman and his family heard the gospel and received Jesus as their savior. The good news was too good to keep to themselves and they shared the gospel with others in the tribe. The chief was very angry, and he had the tribesman and his family dragged before the village. Stop following Jesus, the chief demanded. The tribesman replied, No, I have decided to follow Jesus. I am not turning back. The chief was furious and killed the tribesman's children. Stop following Jesus, the chief insisted. The tribesman replied, Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. The chief showed no mercy, and he killed the tribesman's wife. Now you will stop following this Jesus, the chief said. The tribesman looked the chief in the eyes and replied, The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. The chief could not believe his ears and he killed the tribesman. Jesus said, if a grain of wheat dies, it bears much fruit. And that day, many of the villagers who witnessed the persecution of that tribesman and his family also decided to follow Jesus. Even the chief himself became a follower of Jesus Christ. The tribesman's last words became the song of the village, and today it is sung all around the world. I have decided.
second guessing we know that we are protected may the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message grace and favors in your nature in your essence may favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations Thank you. 